Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Lenten worship services. Paul will be sharing his thoughts on Thy will be done with us this evening. Let us begin with the opening hymn, Chief of Sinners, so I be. Chief of Sinners, so I be. Jesus shed his blood for me. Die that I might live on high. Live us that I might never die. As the branch is soon on, I am his and he is mine. It have Jesus' love, higher than the heavens above, deeper than the depths of sea, lasting as eternity. Love that found me, wondrous thought, found me when I sought him not. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched person I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law, the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? It is God who justifies. Who then? is the one who condemns no one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, do not leave me to my own understanding. Let me now enter into that holy darkness with Saul, where my assumptions about what make me right or good or religious can come under your scrutiny. Show me where my vision is at odds with yours. Cause the scales to fall from my eyes, that I may emerge from the darkness, strengthened in my witness, when utterly dependent on your grace. Conform my mind and will to yours. 
Amen. Our first reading this evening is from the seventh chapter of Acts. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of the young man named Saul. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He drag, dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Here ends the first reading. And the second lesson is from Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Go to the house of Judas on State Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. He has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Here ends the second reading. God's will and my worldview. Later to be known as Apostle Paul, I am Paul this evening, as you know me also as Saul, the Pharisee of Pharisees. I intensely persecuted followers of Jesus. You see, I took Hashim, king of the universe, blessed be he, very seriously. I took the study of his Torah very seriously. So naturally, 
I took violations of his holy law and blasphemy very seriously. I also took myself very seriously. And with him, no, you know, God, that doesn't play very well. There were many scriptures that I thought were written in support of me. The holy prophet Isaiah wrote, In Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Now, when it says the people, it does not mean the Gentiles themselves. It means the people of the Holy One who live among the Gentiles in Galilee. And when it says who live in darkness, it does not mean that there are so many clouds in the sun and that the sun does not shine. It means rather that they are in spiritual darkness of having departed from his holiness. And when it says I have seen a great light, what is that light? The heat and fire of, it, of God's judgment upon them? And it says later in the same chapter, destined for burning, and they will be fuel for the fire. But by the grace of the Holy Lord, who is forever blessed, I was called to be that judgment, to bring that light and fire to those of Galilee who blasphemed, who thought their crucified criminal leader equal to the one. But the holy prophet Amos wrote of the coming judgment. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord, for that day will be darkness, not light. And for when I read the words of the great warrior David, your word, your word is a lamp for my feet. It is a light for my path. This was the side of King David and God at the end that God was on our side. The old king knew better than that, and I should have too. A light for my feet, a lamp for my path. When the light appeared to me, Father David, it was so bright and so piercing that I couldn't see the path anymore or my feet, and I was blinded for three days. When this light shone, I thought I heard a voice or a presence with an aha as it searched me out and discovered me. Painful and harsh, blinding light and a aha, a sound or presence. Who are you, sir? I dared ask. I am Jesus, came the dreadful reply. Whom you persecute, he said. The very blaspheming Galilean who caused all the trouble. Oh, gosh, was he a thorn in my side. I hated him and his people for their ungodly ways. By heaven, my anger burned with the heat and light. Well, I thought it burned with heat and light, but my anger was nothing now. Faced with this light. What I thought was a holy, righteous anger seemed little more than irritation, like an annoyance of being poked in the ribs when you're sitting comfortably. And there was a smile in that blessed voice now as he said to me gently, but irritatingly, it's hard for you when you kick, kick against the goad, you know, the cattle prod, all of my proud ideas, my career plans, my self-image came crashing down like great big rickety house built on sand, and everything went dark. I could not see. My darkness brought on but light, but what I did not know of light before this. What did, what did I know of righteous anger? What holiness or justice or love? I knew nothing. The greatest, the highest, the most noble achievement I have managed this far was to be irritated. I, I feel the Holy One, blessed be he, poking me in the ribs with his cattle goad, his irritant, you know, that Jesus. And instead of going where he wanted, 
I tried to follow a different path. Uh, I kicked out. Uh, I saw myself as a, a silly but educated, self-righteous, ineffectual man. My colleagues led me by the hand to our accommodation in Damascus. And as the road was straight, I still bumbled into things. It's hard for you when you can't see. And when you kick out and rebel against the prodding, Jesus was an irritant, deliberately. God's irritant, pushing me the right way. Now, Peter told me once a story about when he got it wrong, as obviously I've got this wrong. Jesus told him about the cross, and Peter tried to talk him out of it. You're too special and too precious to die, Peter said. Jesus got angry. Peter said it reminded him of a weird episode the week before. Jesus healed a blind man, except like Peter and like me, he could see, but he couldn't see clearly enough. Men looking like trees. The man needed more healing. More Jesus. You can have ears to hear, but not hear, Jesus used to say. You can have eyes to see and still not see. But Jesus traveled to where people were and healed them. And he sought me out and blinded me. Seek me out now and heal me, Jesus. How had I missed the son's resemblance to the father? When our parents first sinned back in the garden, God did not stand apart and judge, but came back. He walked up and down in the garden, asking awkward questions. Where are you? And in our day, he, he does it again, waking up, walking up, up and down among us and saying, where are you? How did I miss it? Well, Jesus came looking for us, calling us. That's Jesus. He'll walk straight up to you, and he'll spit in your eyes, and then your eyes are opened, and you see for the very first time. Blessed be he, the king of the universe, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace, whose governance there will be no end. Let us pray. O oh Lord, thank you for giving us the example of St. Paul, whose worldview was transformed in a way that brought the message of the gospel to light in dramatic fashion, awakening in us a sense of awe and wonder at how what Christ did for us on the cross changes everything about how we see the world and how we live our lives for him. O Christ, who came to save the world, let us see the world through your eyes. Sometimes, O Savior, our worldview can get blurry and out of focus. For that, we are truly sorry. Through the study of your word, time in worship, and a deeper prayer life. Help us to get refocused on you 
and clearer in our commitment to your will and your way. O Christ, who came to save the world, let us see the world through your eyes. Work in the hearts of those who have turned away from you and those who seek to do your followers harm. Bring messengers of your gospel to them, like Ananias, and warm their cold hearts, that they may turn their lives around and turn toward you. Make us bold in our service to be like Ananias to those who are breathing threats against you. May we be beacons of hope and sources of saving news to all your wandering sheep. O Christ, who came to save the world, let us see the world through your eyes. After his conversion, St. Paul spent his life teaching and preaching the good news of Jesus to nations far and wide. Dear Lord, help us to support all of those in our community who continue the work of St. Paul and give us generous hearts to support the work of missionaries who live in far-off lands, often in the very places where St. Paul set foot. Grant them receptive hearts and minds to the message of the salvation found through your death and resurrection. O Christ, who came to save the world, let us see the world through your eyes. St. Paul went through many trials in his time serving the Lord, and we too struggle as we serve you. Be with those who are sick and injured, hospitalized or homebound. Give them an extra measure of your grace and fill them with confidence that no matter what happens, you are with them and you will be their rock of refuge. O Christ, who came to save the world, let us see the world through your eyes. Dear Jesus, supply renew resolved to all those who are persecuted throughout the world for your sake. Keep your cross always before them. Let them never succumb to fear or doubt, but only have faith that the road ahead leads ultimately to their salvation. O Christ who came to save the world, let us see the world through your eyes. All these petitions we offer in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who did the will of God and lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. And our closing hymn is Jesus' priceless treasure. 
Jesus' priceless treasure, source of purest pleasure, truest friend to me. Ah, how long I've panted, and my heart has fainted, thirsting, Lord, for thee. Thine I am, O spotless lamb. Nothing in this world can dot me, not I ask besides thee.